Hi, everyone. This is Joseph Sulia again, S-U-G-L-I-A. And I will be reading for you my translation into English of Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, Jenseits von Gut und Böse. And we left off with 193. Quid quid luce fuit, tenebris agit. What happens in the light also happens in the darkness, but also the reverse. What we experience in dreams belongs to the economy of our soul, as if it were something that we really experienced. On the proviso that we dream experience it often enough, thereby capacitated, we become richer or poorer, have more needs or fewer needs, and become finally, in the clear light of day, and even in the most cheerful moments of our waking spirit, a little cosseted by the habits of our dreams. Presuming that someone flies often in his dreams and after having so dreamt, becomes conscious of the power and the art of flying as if it were his own prerogative, as if it were, as if he were fortunate to have this talent, which is peculiar to him and worthy of envy. Such a person who believes himself capable of actualizing every contour and corner of flight with the gentlest impulse. He who knows the feeling of a particular divine levity, the feeling of a go up without tension or compulsion, the feeling of a go down without condescension or degradation, without gravitas. How could such a person who has such dream experiences and dream habits, how could such a person not find the word fortunate differently colored and differently defined in his waking day? How could every other kind of flying, the swinging upward as the poets describe it, not seem too terrestrial, too muscular, too violent, even too heavy for him? Paragraph 194, the diversity of human beings displays itself not merely in the diversity of their tables of goods, that is in the way in which they consider certain goods to be worthy of striving after, and the disagreements among them over the more and the less, the hierarchy of commonly recognized goods. The diversity of human beings shows itself much more in the different ways in which they consider what counts as genuine appropriation, what it means to really have something. With respect to a woman, for instance, more modest men regard disposition over her body and sexual enjoyment to be a sufficient and satisfactory sign of having, of possession. Someone who has a more mistrustful and fastidious thirst for possession will see the question mark in the above definition. He will see the mere appearance of possession within and will demand a more meticulous examination in order to know not merely whether the woman belongs to him alone, but to know what she has abandoned, to know that she has abandoned everything that she has and that she would like to have. Only this qualifies as possession for him. A third man, however, would not consider this to be the end of his mistrust and his desire for ownership. He asks himself whether the woman, even if she abandons everything for his sake, is not doing so for a phantasmal version of himself. Above all, he wants to be fundamentally, even abyssally, known by her before he is loved by her at all. He dares to allow himself to be found out. Only then does he feel in total possession of the beloved. When she is no longer deceived by him, when she loves him for his devilry and hidden insatiability, as much as she loves him for his kindness, his patience, 
and his intellectuality. Another would like to possess an entire population and all of the higher arts of Cagliostro and Catalina are appropriate to this purpose. Another who has a delicate thirst for possession says to himself, never deceive where you would possess. He is irritated by the idea, made impatient by the idea, that a mask of himself rules the hearts of the people. Therefore, I must make myself known, and before all else, know myself. Among serviceable and benevolent people, a vulgar guilefulness appears almost regularly. Those whom they help must first be dressed up in order to receive their help. As if the unfortunate, for instance, should earn their help. As if those who demand their help should be profoundly grateful for their help. As if those who demand their help should prove themselves to be dependent, submissive. With these imaginings, they dispose themselves over the unfortunate as if he were their possession, as if they were benevolent and serviceable people merely out of their desire for possession. These people are jealous when someone crosses them while they are helping or when someone helps an unfortunate before they do. Parents involuntarily do something similar with their children. They call it education. No mother doubts in the core of her heart that the child was born to be her property. No father contests his right to subject the child to his conceptions and valuations. Indeed, formerly, it seemed easy for fathers to dispose over the life and the death of the neonate, as it was with the ancient Germans. And as it was with the father, now the teacher, the social station, the priest, the prince, sees within every new person the surefire opportunity for a new possession from which it follows ellipsis dot 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 um, from which it follows if I may continue Nietzsche's path of, reflect, of reflection, from which it follows that human beings are animated by the will to power. That everyone, every human being, has the desire for appropriation, the desire for assimilation. Not assimilation in the sense of fitting in, of integrating into a crowd, into a, a commonality. No the desire to assimilate other human beings, the desire for possession. All of us do. This flame rages within each one of us. I mean, love is a form of appropriation. Love is a form of appropriation. Compassion too is appropriative. And yet this is another difference, yet another difference between Nietzsche and his unofficial teacher, his ex officio mentor, Schopenhauer, right? Schopenhauer believed that human beings are motivated by three impulses, egoism, compassion, and malice. And notice what Nietzsche does here. Nietzsche erases compassion from this list, or more precisely stated, he relegates compassion to egoism or malice, right? Nietzsche reduces compassion. He distills compassion to malice or to egoism. There is no such thing for Nietzsche as pure compassion, pure compassionateness. There's no such thing as pure compassionateness because there's no such thing for Nietzsche as pure selflessness that doesn't exist for him. All compassion is the instantiation of the desire for appropriation. 
you are compassionate toward those for whom you feel pity. And what accompanies pity? Contempt. For whom do we feel contempt? For those whom we consider to be inferior to us and those whom we want to own, to possess, to appropriate. We want to make those for whom we feel pity, for those for whom we feel compassion, dependent on us in some way, right? We want to make them instruments, implements, utensils of our power, appendages of our strength. Someone who needs our compassion needs us. That's the main point. And recognizes us as the sovereign, as the superior, as the one who has more power than they, right? For whom do we feel compassion again? Those who are powerless or those who have an inferior degree of power in relationship to our level of power. Remember for Nietzsche, all relations are power relations. All relations are power relations. All relationships are relationships of power. That is the meaning of the phrase, the will to power, which describes all of existence and not just human existence. So a few more remarks on this truly remarkable passage. It's a remarkable passage. Notice the examples that Nietzsche gives us, right? There's the third lover, and the third lover does not want his beloved, the woman whom he loves, his enamorata, to love a phantasmal version of him, right? That isn't enough for him. It's not enough for him that she loves the phantasm, right? No, 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 no. He wants his beloved to love him in all of his nakedness, in all of his factuality, in all of his ugliness, right? And the fourth lover wants his beloved to love him in all of his wickedness, in all of his sinister characteristics. He wants, the, the, the fourth lover wants his beloved to love him not despite his malicious qualities, no, but because of his malicious qualities. So no, it's not possible for advanced human beings, for Nietzsche. I mean, what Nietzsche is doing is he's giving us a kind of scale of masterly. I'm sorry, a what Nietzsche is doing here is he's giving us a kind of scale of mastery, of masterfulness, an ascending scale of mastery, an ascending scale of masterfulness. Um, you see the most sophisticated the most pensive, the most profound human beings, the most profound masters, do not want to be simply obeyed. That is not enough for them, again. Um, I mean, consider the father who is very authoritarian and he wants his son to visit his grandmother. I mean, the father's mother, the son's grandmother. So. He pounds, the father pounds, the authoritarian father pounds on the son's bedroom door, right? Bang, bang, bang. Son, put down that Xbox. Get in the SUV. We're going to grandma's house. Oh, dad, do I have to? Yes, you have to. Yes, you have to. Get in the SUV now. You're coming whether you want to or not. That's the authoritarian father. But then there's the totalitarian father. Um, which is both mo more, he's more sophisticated than the authoritarian father, but he's also worse than the authoritarian father because the, the totalitarian father will knock on the son's door gently and say, hey, Ace, um, I'm sorry to bother you, but do you want to go to grandma's house? Oh, no, Brian. The son calls his father, Brian. I want to play Call of Duty or Minecraft. Or Fortnite. Yeah, come on, champ. Oh, come on. 
come on, you know you want to. You know you want to go to Grandma's house. You know it will make you a better person. Yeah. So the totalitarian ruler demands total ownership, which means the totalitarian ruler demands that the desires of his subject or her subject comply and conform. So it's not enough that the subject complies and conforms. No, no. The totalitarian ruler wants to have total ownership of the person, of the subject, of the follower. So the totalitarian ruler wants the subject's desires to conform and to comply. What does that mean? So it's not the authoritarian ruler who says, you're going to do this whether you want to do it or not. No, 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 no. This is the totalitarian ruler who wants to get inside of the head of his or her subjects, his or her followers. You see, the totalitarian ruler is more sophisticated than the authoritarian ruler because he or she wants to possess the soul of the subject, his or her object of power. So external, external obedience is not enough for the totalitarian ruler. Mere obedience is not enough. It's not enough to obey the law. It's not enough just to obey the law. No, you have to love the law. You have to respect the law. You have to have achtung for the law. You see, you mustn't merely obey the law. You must obey the law with every fiber of your being. That's the point. You must believe in the law. You must be in love with the law. You must absorb the law. You must interiorize the law according to the totalitarian dictator. The law must become part of you. You must willingly and completely submit yourself to the law. Then we're talking about totalitarian dictatorships. The totalitarian dictator does not merely mandate submission to the law. No, no, no. Reluctant obedience is not enough. Reluctant submissiveness is not enough. Reluctant conformism is not enough for him or for her. That would be mere force. In German, force is Kraft, K-R-A-F-T which has nothing to do with artificially processed cheese. No, the opposite of that is Macht, M-A-C-H-T, power. There is a dyad between Kraft and Macht, between force and power. Well, what is the difference? They don't mean the same thing. Opposed to force is power, right? Force is mere compulsion. You force a person to do what you want that person to do. But obedience, again, in force is merely external. You force a person to say what you want that person to say. You force a person to do what you want that person to do. Um, you force that person to act according to your schema. But power is much more deeper than that. And it's much more intrusive, much more interiorizing much more infiltrating and insinuating and insidious. Power is. Power is that. Because power comes inside of you. Power issues into you. It insinuates its way into you. That's one way of distinguishing power from force, right? Force is violence. Um, force is the threat of violence at the very least. But power is much more effective than force. You know, as opposed to force, power suffuses your entire being. Well, what am I talking about? You might know the parable of the wind and the sun. So the wind and the sun make a bet. Who can get the man below, below the heavens to remove his hat? Who can get him to do that? Well, the wind blows the hat from the man's head. That's easy enough. The wind sets in motion its gusts, its thrashes, and billows the hat from the man's head. 
the wind buffets the man with its violence. That's easy enough, right? It's simple, it's easy. But the sun, on the other hand, beats down its rays onto the head of the man until the man swelters, he sweats, he's sweaty, and he grows uncomfortable and he voluntarily removes the hat himself. He willingly does so. So the son gets the man to remove his own hat by weaving its way into the man's head and heart and soul. So who emerges victorious? Well, obviously it's the sun. The sun triumphs over the wind. It's clear, isn't it? Um, why is the sun the victor? Why is that? Well, the goal is to remove the hat from the man's head, right? But the sun is so much more subtle, right? The sun beats down its rays, radiates on the man, gets the man to remove his own hat willingly. Well, that's power. So the wind represents force and the sun represents power. Macht. The man is uncomfortable and voluntarily removes his own hat. Thus, who wins? Clearly the sun, because the sun gets the subject to do what the sun wants him to do by fooling the man into thinking that that is in his best interest. And who is to say that it's not? But the sun gets the man to act according to what the man believes to be his own schema. So the sun is able to realize its desires through the vehicle, through the vector of the man. That is much different than exerting mere compulsion, mere force, mere violence. Uh, so that's one of the things that Nietzsche is suggesting that although the mask is necessary in order to secure power, in order to seize a position of authority, one must don a mask, one must wear a mask. Um, to accede to power, A-C-C-E-D-E, in order to exceed in power, E-X-C-E-E-D. So in order to accede to power and then exceed in power, one must wear a mask. Everybody knows that. I mean, Machiavelli, Machiavelli taught us that. And, and Machiavelli states that clearly, whom Nietzsche certainly read, right? Yes, you need to be crafty, you need to be cunning, you need to be devious in order to seize power and secure power. Everyone knows that already, I think. Um, in order to occupy a position of authority, you have to be mendacious. Nietzsche is not the first person to say that. Again, Machiavelli said that. Everyone knows that from Machiavelli. But then one, but then once one becomes a leader, what then? You're a ruler, you're a sovereign, you're a prince. Well, then you're no longer satisfied with the mask wearing of your toadies, your stooges, your minions, your flatterers, your professional flatterers, your courtiers. Even though everyone needs to wear a mask in order to occupy a position of power, once one exceeds with an A to power, to a position of power, one is no longer satisfied with mask wearing. The mask wearing of one's followers, one's subjects, one's courtiers. Why? Well, the courtiers flatter and they flatter and they flatter. But the sovereign is never satisfied with their empty flatteries because he knows that the flattery is hollow. He already knows that the sovereign does not want masked devotion from his followers. He wants maskless, undisguised, unfeigned dedication and admiration. Now, I know not all power is, is absolute. Power is not necessarily absolute, sure. But one thing is certain, power does desire absoluteness. And what is absolute? 
What does it mean to be absolute? To be, to be absolute is to be absolved from all relations, to be, a, to be exempt. How, uh, absoluteness means to be exempt for, from all power. Uh, I'm sorry, the absolute means to be exempt from all qualification, from all definition, from all limitation, from all exceptions. And power desires nothing other than its own absoluteness. Power wants to absolutize itself. That is the nature of power. Power wants to become absolute. Power is satisfied with nothing less than its own absolutizement. To say it once more, if power does not reach its absolutizement, it will not be satisfied with itself. And even though power wields a mask, wears a mask, dons a mask, it is not satisfied when the followers wear masks. It's not satisfied then. Power demands absolute complacence. I don't mean complacency. No, I mean C-O-M-P-L-A-I-S-A-N-C-E. -E. Complacence meaning, you know, affability, um, the desire to please authority at all costs, um, even, even to the extent of putting one's life at stake, even, even to the point of putting one's health at risk, that kind of that kind of affability, that, that kind of submissiveness. That's what power demands of its subjects. 196, it may be inferred that there are innumerable dark bodies near the sun, bodies that we have never seen. Between us, that is a parable. And a psychologist of morals reads the whole of celestiography as nothing more than a parable, and as a semiology which is silent about so much. Yeah, I'm very proud of uh, the way in which I translated one word there. Uh, the word in German is Stadenschrift, which literally, I mean, the dictionary definition is um, asterisk. But in this passage, in the context, it's clear that Nietzsche doesn't mean asterisk. He means the writing in the heavens, so I translated that as celestiography. 197. Animal predators and human predators, such as Cesare Borgia, are fundamentally misunderstood. Nature is misunderstood so long as we are looking for sickliness at the core of the healthiest tropical monsters and vegetative growths. We do not understand them at all when we go looking for a hell that would be born within them, as almost all moralists thus far have done. Does it not seem that the moralists hate the primeval forest and the tropics? And does it not seem that they consider the tropical human to be a disease and a kind of human degeneracy, as if the tropical human were its own hell and self-torment? Why then, in favor of the temperate zones, in favor of the temperate humans, in favor of the moralists, the mediocre, this for a chapter entitled Morality as Timorousness. Yeah, this is a typically Nietzschean passage. I mean, Nietzsche is implying that if one is a real psychologist of morality in the scientific sense, the one should not moralize, one should not impose one's morals onto the object of one's study, one would not be sanctimonious if one is a genuine psychologist of morals, and one wouldn't make moral judgments, in other words. So don't adjudicate in a moral way upon one subject. You know, I'm reminded of um, Nietzsche's interpretation of Shakespeare's Macbeth. You know, I say Shakespeare's Macbeth. I don't know if there's another Macbeth, but the play, the tragedy of Macbeth. Um, in, uh, in Daybreak, in Morgenröte, Nietzsche makes the point therein that it is quite delightful to read Macbeth because Macbeth is the figure of the heroic villain or the villainous hero. He doesn't actually use those terms, to be fair, but that's what he means. Um, Nietzsche does see in the figure of Macbeth a kind of heroic villain or a villainous hero, right? 
And we are the spectators. We as spectators or as readers of the play take a kind of delight in Macbeth's commitment to evil. <laughs> um, and we vicariously enjoy Macbeth's commitment to evil. That's, that's what Nietzsche is saying in, in Daybreak. The reason that Macbeth is so captivating to us is that he is doing things that we're not allowed to do. Um, but more pointedly, we find him so captivating because he is so vigorous. He's vigorous and dynamic and he's full of vitality. He's affirmative of life in all of its violence, in all of its tumultuousness. That's Macbeth. And that's why we identify with, with Macbeth because he possesses those very traits. We, we are the spectators, we are the readers of the play, and we are able to vicariously enjoy, to delight in, to take delight in the blissfulness of evil the freedom of evil in the context of a spectacle. So it's just a spectacle though. So it has no direct effect on our life. It doesn't hurt us in any way. Um, that's why Macbeth is so captivating. Um, by which I mean, by which Nietzsche means both the, the figure, the character of Macbeth, but also the play by Shakespeare. The tragedy of Macbeth by William Shakespeare. Um, I have to confess that I differ from Nietzsche on this point because it seems to me that Macbeth is neither good nor evil. Nietzsche sees Macbeth as evil. I don't think he's good. I don't think he's evil because he has no free will. And if he has no free will, he has no moral responsibility. Do you see what I'm doing here? I'm reading Nietzsche against Nietzsche. <laughs> um, it's like I'm reading the Nietzsche of human all too human against the Nietzsche of daybreak. Um, no, Macbeth has no moral responsibility at all. He's buffeted by the winds of necessity. He's carried along. He's driven by the winds of necessity, the forces of necessity. Um, so those moralizing commentators who see in Macbeth a fallen angel, a reprobate, a sinner, someone who has fallen from grace, all of that, they're wrong. But Nietzsche is also wrong, I think. I mean, for, well, I mean, Macbeth is presented as being quite sympathetic in the play, and a close reading of the play would bear that out. If you're interested, you may read my essay on Macbeth. It's available on um, my essay site, my essay website. Um, but I also think that Nietzsche is wrong about Macbeth, I have to confess. 198, all of these morals directed at individuals in order to foster their happiness as it is called, what are these morals other than proposals on how to behave in relation to the degree of danger in which an individual lives with himself or herself? They are prescriptions against the passions, their good and bad tendencies, inasmuch as they have the will to power and want to play the master. Artifices large and small, clever stratagems large and small, the reek of old household appliances clinging to them. All of them have a Baroque and irrational form. All of them have a Baroque and irrational form. Since they are applied to everything, since they generalize where one is not permitted to generalize, all of them speak absolutely. All of them are taken absolutely. All of them are seasoned with more than just a grain of salt. Moreover, they are only tolerable and even become seductive when they are over-seasoned and stench dangerously of otherworldliness above all. Considered intellectually, they are worth little and are hardly scientific, much less wise. Rather, to say it one more time and to say it three more times, smartness, 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 intermeshed, interspersed with stupidity, stupidity, stupidity. Whether it is the advice or the curative of the Stoics, 
indifference and stone column coldness toward the fiery foolishness of the affects, or whether it is the laugh no moreness and cry no moreness of Spinoza, who naively advocated for the destruction of the affects through analysis and vivisection, or whether it is the toning down of the affects to a harmless middle ground where they could be easily satisfied as it is in moral Aristotelianism. Even morality as the gratification of the affects through a deliberate dilution and spiritualization and the symbolism of the arts. Something like this is done in music or divine love or a love for humanity for the sake of God. For in religion, the passions obtain their civil rights again, provided that there is smartness, 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 and stupidity, stupidity, stupidity. Ultimately, even in that accommodating and spirited surrender to the affects taught by Hafiz and Goethe, that bold slackening of the reins, that spiritual corporeal licentia morum, in the exceptional cases of wise fogies and sods for whom little is dangerous anymore. This too for the chapter, morality as timorousness. 199. For as long as there have been human beings, there have also been human herds, generations, communities, lineages, populations, states, churches. Moreover, there have always been masses of obedient subordinates in relation to a small number of commanding leaders. Taken from this perspective, therefore, it has always been obedience that has been practiced by and bred within human beings. One may easily posit that on average, there is a need which is innate within human beings, a kind of formal conscience that gives this order, thou shalt absolutely do this thing, or thou shalt absolutely forbear from doing this thing. In brief, thou shalt. This need strives to satiate itself and to fill itself with content. The need for obedience absorbs whatever a commander screams in its ear, no matter who that commander might be, whether that commander is a parent, a teacher, the law, class judgment, or public opinion. It seizes and assumes these orders as indiscriminately as a crude appetite would, according to its own strength, impatience, and intensity. This strange delimitation of human development is based on the fact that the herd instinct is inherited best and at the cost of the art of commanding. Manifestations of the herd instinct include hesitations and prolongations, frequent retrogressions, and rotations. Imagine if this instinct proceeds to its final excesses there will be an absence of commanders and independent human beings, or the commanders and independent human beings will suffer inwardly from a bad conscience and will need to deceive themselves into believing that they are commanding when they are only obeying, such as the actual state of affairs in Europe. I call it the moral hypocrisy of the commandant. The only way that they know how to shield their bad consciences is acting as if they were the executors of, of older and loftier commands from their ancestors, from their constitutions, their rights, their laws, or even their God, sometimes to protect themselves from their bad consciences. They even borrow herd ways of thinking or herd maxims, such as the first servant of the people or the instrument of the common good. On the other hand, today's European herd, human, gives the appearance of being the only human who is permitted to extol those traits which make him tame, congenial, and useful to the herd as the only actual human virtues. Thus, sense of commonality, benevolence, considerateness, industriousness, moderation, modesty, indulgence, pity. These are virtues. Now let's remember, the virtues for Nietzsche are nothing more than sublimations of base, vulgar, crass impulses, instincts. However, even though these impulses are sublimated, they are sublimated without sublimity. There is nothing sublime about them, even at the end of this process, even when these, even when these crass impulses are raised up to the virtues. 
they're still not sublime, even though they're sublimated. For those cases, however, in which one believes that one cannot dispense with a leader and bellwether, today, one makes experiment after experiment in replacing that commander by adding together a herd of clever herd humans, such as the origin, for example, of all representative constitutions. What a benevolent act for those European herd animals. What a redemption from intolerable pressure when someone appears who can give absolute commands to the European herd animals. The effect of Napoleon's appearance is the final piece of major evidence of this fact. The history of Napoleon's influence is almost the history of higher happiness brought about in the most valuable human beings and moments in the whole of the current century, which is, as you know, the 19th century, right? Nietzsche, again, is bemoaning the lack of rigor in modern culture. And he believes that modern culture is stultifying intellectually humanity, in particular, the most exceptional human beings of all. Nietzsche is here writing about the equalization and the leveling off of distinction in the modern world. Equalization is the equalization and leveling off mark modernity. They are the fundamental traits, the fundamental characteristics of modernity. They, they mark the modern world. The modern world, modern culture, is not rigorous enough for Nietzsche. And it is, again, it is intellectually stultifying. Nietzsche is writing here about how in modernity standards have been softened. Whether we are talking about uh, intellectual standards, linguistic standards, political standards, aesthetical standards, uh, literary standards, any kind of cultural standards. They have all been mollified. They've all been lowered. They've all been dumbed well down in the modern world. Everyone has been leveled off. Everyone is, has gone linear, has been forced to go linear. Everyone has been reduced to the same. Nietzsche, let's be careful though, Nietzsche's not writing against equal rights here. He's not inveighing against civil rights, not at all. Yes, he can be contemptuous of democracy here and there, but that's not the point here. That's not the point here. Um, that's not the point he is making here. Not at all. What Nietzsche is opposed to really is the banalization of the world. The normalization of the world. The making average, the making ordinary, the making mediocre of the world. The reduction of standards, the dumbing down of standards that characterize modernity, and the making same, the making same of every human being. The reduction of differences to the identical, the one and the same. The leveling off of differences between people between one person and another person, I should say. The destruction of singularity, the destruction of uniqueness. Modern culture is a culture in which everyone is expected to be the same and no differences are tolerated, no real differences. I mean, people are categorized the reduction of talent, the reduction of distinction, the leveling off of all nuance, the eradication of differences between one human being and another human being is what marks the modern world. This is not a defense of tyranny, though. This is not a defense of dictatorship. It's far from it. Quite the opposite, I would say, quite the opposite. 
no, this, this is an attack on the modern world. This is an attack on, on the age of modernity, which is the age of the crowd. What Nietzsche calls the herd. And let there be mo no mistake, he's referring to humanity as the herd. Most, the common run of humanity as the herd. He's not thinking of any particular group. And a crowd can easily convert itself, can transmute itself into a mob. I think we talked about this before, maybe not, but mob. The word mob is etymologically related to mobility and mobilize. The crowd, when it is mobilized, becomes a mob because a mob is the crowd in motion. The mob is the crowd in action. And mobs are violent. That's a problem. If modern history has taught us anything at all, it has taught us that. And again, this is not a critique of civil rights or of equal rights, and this passage should not be misrepresented in such a fashion. Um, to do so is just bad philology practiced by people who don't read. And this is, this is really Nietzsche's diagnosis of the modern world. In the modern world, differences are reduced to the same, to the universal same, to indistinguishableness, universal sameness, banality. That's what Nietzsche is saying. Two hundred. Any person who lives in this age, the age of no. Hold on a minute. Two hundred and one. So long as usefulness, especially herd usefulness, dominates moral judgments, as long as one's gaze is directed at the preservation of the community, as long as the immoral, in quotes, is considered to be whatever seems to endanger the survival of the community, there can be no morality of neighborly love. Suppose that there is already the constant practice of considerateness, pity, equity, gentleness, reciprocity of helpfulness. Suppose that in the current state of society, all of the drives that will be later described with the honorable title of virtues and will almost coincide with the concept of morality. Suppose that these drives are, all, are already active and do not belong at all to the realm of moral valuations. They are extra moral. An act of pity, for instance, in the best days of Rome was neither good nor evil. And if it was praised for what it was, that praise would coincide in the best cases with a kind of involuntary deprecation as soon as that act was held up as something that promoted the common good, as something that served the res publica. Ultimately, the love of the neighbor is something, always something irrelevant, partly conventional and arbitrary phenomenal in relation to the fear of the neighbor after the structure of society is established as a whole and seems to be secured against external dangers, the fear of the neighbor creates yet new perspectives of moral valuation, certain strong and dangerous drives, such as the lust for endeavor, the lust for endeavor, daring adventurousness, the addiction to vengeance, slyness, rapacity, the lust for domination were not only honored, under other names, but cultivated and bred. Because the whole of society was in danger and protection against enemies was needed. Now the dangerousness of these drives is felt to be double. Now there are no longer escape valves for them to be released. Gradually they are marked as immoral and surrendered to defamation. Now the opposing drives and inclinations are raised to the status of moral honor. Step by step the herd instinct draws its conclusion. This is the moral perspective. Regardless of how much or how little danger to the community or to equality there dwells within an opinion, in a state, in an affect, in a will, in a talent, fear is yet again the mother of morality. When the highest and strongest drives explode in passion, 
driving the individual far over the average and above the depressions of the herd conscience. The self-esteem of the community is wrecked. Its belief in itself, its backbone, as it were, is shattered. As a result, these are the drives that are stigmatized and defamed. Lofty, untrammeled intellectuality, the will to stand alone, and the great reason are all perceived as dangerous. Everything that elevates the individual above the herd, everything that terrifies will be called evil from now on. The cheap, the modest, the orderly, the equalizing mentality, the mediocrity of desires are given moral names and honors. Finally, under peaceable conditions, the opportunity and the necessity of educating the feelings of strength and severity are lacking more and more. And now every form of severity, even injustice, perturbs the conscience. A lofty, difficult, aristocratic attitude is almost considered to be offensive and awakens mistrust, as does self-responsibility. It is the lamb that wins respect, no better the sheep. There is a stage of pathological pulverization and tenderization in the history of society when society takes sides with those who do an injury, with criminals. And it does so earnestly and honestly. Punishment? That seems somehow illiberal to this society. It is certain that the ideas of punishment and deserving punishment cause a society pain, are terrifying to the society. Isn't it sufficient to make him harmless? Why should there be more punishment? Punishment itself is terrible. With this question, herd morality, the morality of timorousness, draws its final conclusion. Assuming that one could even abolish the danger, the ground of all fear altogether, even then one would abolish morality along with it. It would no longer be necessary. It would no longer consider itself necessary. Whoever tests the conscience of today's European will extract the same imperative from 1,000 moral folds and pockets. The imperative of herd timorousness. We wish that there would somehow finally be nothing more to fear. Somehow, finally, the will and the way to that point is called today everywhere in Europe progress. But progression is really retrogression. A progressive step is really a retrogressive step. So progress, progress. And what is Nietzsche writing about exactly? What is he writing about? It should be clear by now. Progress in the modern world is mediocritization. Progress is the making mediocre of everyone and everything so that every cultural production must be mediocre and every person must be mediocre. If it's truly daring and exciting and complex and profound and challenging and provocative, an artist, for example, will be decried not merely as bad, but as sinister, wicked, evil, immoral. The same thing for a book. The, for the very fact that, that this book makes somebody think, or a film, or a play, a poem, the very fact that it challenges a conventional way of thinking, of seeing the world, um, if it destabilizes in thought one's relationship to the world, one's relationships to other human beings, one's relationship to oneself, it's going to be decried as evil. It will be demonized, diabolized. And what is good then? Nietzsche tells us in this passage. Well, what is good is passive, uh, sheep-like, ovine, ovine and bovine, more ovine than bovine. What is good is the average, and the fundamental trait of the modern world is the making average, the making ordinary, the making normal, the making banal of everything and everyone, as I would say, uh, and the mediocre shall inherit the earth. And this is what is happening today. The most mediocre people you will ever meet in your life are occupying positions of authority. This happens all of the time. 
um, we live in a mediocracy, <laughs> not a, no, I don't mean a rule by the mainstream media, the legacy media. I mean, a rule by the mediocre, the rule of the mediocre. Just the most normal, unremarkable, boring, unimpressive, unextraordinary people you will ever meet in your life occupy positions of authority. And, and if someone does show even the modicum of a glimpse of a tincture of a jot of an iota of a scintilla of talent, What's going to happen to that person? That person's going to be ostracized, persecuted, oppressed for being too different, for wrong think. And those who show any kind of intellectual sophistication, young people who show promise in their schools, um, talk about elementary school, high school, they will be persecuted for wrong think, especially in the United States of mediocrity. In America, intelligence is reviled as if it were a vice. As if it were a vice. Let me say that again. Because the screen became gelatinous for a second. I don't know if this was recorded. In America, intelligence is reviled as if it were a vice. This is exactly what Nietzsche is writing about. Intelligence is vilified as if it were a crime. Nietzsche also writes about independence. Independence is vilified as if it were a crime. Or writing differently or on a more sophisticated level than others, or in a more creative manner than others. One is regarded with suspicion if one does that, right? No, you must not know what you're talking about if you do something like that, because everyone must use the same words and everyone must think in the same way. And this is one of the things I've noticed. And this is, this is my diagnosis of culture. It's true, but it is true that Nietzsche didn't live to see this, but he foresaw it. Um, it's true that the vocabulary of the average person is expanding. But have you noticed that everyone uses the same words, the same phrases, the same slogans? Everyone says the same thing. Everyone types the same thing. Why is this? Because everyone is thinking the same thing. Everyone is thinking the same thing. And if you think differently than the crowd, well, maybe, just maybe, the crowd will someday come after you in a flaming brigade with pitchforks and torches. Um, this is not so much what I'm saying, though. This is what Nietzsche is saying. It's implicit in his text. The exceptional are not merely persecuted and ostracized. No, it's worse than that. Their very exceptionality is regarded as evil, and banality is regarded as an absolute good. The fact that, that people are sophisticated, the fact that they are exceptional, is regarded as a form of diabolical evil. So morality does nothing more than sublimate popular prejudices, to say it once more. But this is sublimation without sublimity, because popular prejudices are raised up to the moral good, but the moral good is by no means sublime. Two hundred and two. Let us say once more what we have said one hundred times before. For the ears are not well inclined to such truths, for our truths. We have long since known how offensive it sounds when we reckon human beings to be animals, without ornamentation or metaphor. Blame will almost be attributed to us for referring to human beings of modern ideas with the expressions herd, herd instinct, and so forth. What is to be done about this? We cannot do otherwise, for here, herein dwells our new insight. We have found that wherever the European influence is dominant, all of the main moral judgments of Europe are unanimous, and this includes the countries that are allied with Europe. What Socrates believed not to know and what the famous snake once promised to teach is apparent in Europe. Today's Europeans know what is good and what is evil. Now it must be difficult to listen to. It must sound terrible to one's ears when we repeatedly admit what we believe that we know 
what, what is exalted with praise and with blame, what is called the good is the instinct of that herd animal called the human being. The herd instinct is coming to the fore, exerting preponderance, supremacy over the other instincts in accordance with the growing physiological approximation and alignment of which it is a symptom. Morality in today's Europe is herd animal morality. Therefore, as we come to understand things, it, it is a kind of human morality beside which, before which, and after which many other higher moralities would exist or would be made possible. Again, such a new possibility, again, such a, a new thou shalt, this morality directs all of its forces. It says stubbornly and, and inexorably, I am morality itself and nothing outside of my morality. Indeed, with the assistance of religion, which sublimates and flatters herd animal desires, things have come to the point at which this morality is constantly and visibly expressed in political and social institutions. The democratic movement inherits Christian morality. The tempo, however, is too slow and torpid for the impatient, for the sick, and for those who are addicted to the aforementioned instinct. Evidence can be found in the raving yowls and the forever bared teeth of the anarchistic dogs that course through the streets of European culture in seeming opposition to the peacefully laboring Democrats and revolutionary ideologues in even greater opposition to the idiotic philosophasters and monastically exalted ones who call themselves socialists and who want the free society. In truth, however, all of these forms are united in their fundamental and instinctive enmity toward every social form other than the autonomous herd. To the point that even the socialistic formula ni Dieu ni maître. Merci, Simone. Merci. That means neither God nor master is rejected. Even the concepts of master and slave are rejected. They are all one in their resistance against every exceptional claim, every exceptional right, and that every exceptional privilege, which means in the final analysis, they are against every right. Since when all are, e when all are equal, since when all are equal, no one needs rights anymore. They are all in one, in their mistrust toward punitive justice, as if it were the violation of the weak, a wrong against the necessary consequence of all earlier societies. But even so, they are all one in the religion of pity, of commiseration for whatever feels, lives, and suffers, all the way up to animals, all the way up to God. The excessiveness of pity for God belongs to a democratic epoch. They are all unanimous in their shrieking and in the impatience of their pity, in their moral hatred of suffering in general, in their almost, in their impotence to remain spectators and to allow suffering to happen. They are unanimous in their involuntarily, excuse me, they are, they are unanimous in their involuntary benightedness and tenderization under which Europe seems to be threatened by a new Buddhism. They are one in their faith in the morality of common pity, as if it were morality itself, as if it were the height, the attained height of humanity, the unanimous hope for the future, the means of consolation for those who live in the present, the great dissolvent of all past guilt. They are all one in their faith in the community as the dissolveress. They are all one in their faith in the herd, therefore, in their faith in themselves. 203. Those of us who are of another belief, we who do not see the democratic movement as merely the debasement of political organization, but as the diminution of human beings, as their banalization, and as the degradation of their worth, where do we need to reach with our hopes? Toward new philosophers, there is no other choice. Toward minds that are strong enough and original enough to incite oppositional valuations. Toward minds that are strong enough and original enough to revaluate 
to invert eternal values toward those who were sent out before us, toward the human beings of the future who, in the present, tie the knots and compel the will of millennia down new paths to teach the future of humanity to human beings as their will. The future of humanity is dependent on the human will to prepare for great risks and for the total experiment of discipline and breeding so that the, so that the dreadful hegemony of nonsense and arbitrariness, which was once named history, will come to an end. The nonsense of the greatest number is only its terminal form. For this purpose someday, a new type of philosopher and commander will be necessary. Whatever hidden, frightening, and benevolent spirits have existed, they will seem pale and dwarfish in comparison with this image. The image of such a leader that floats before our eyes. May I say it aloud, my fellow free spirits, the circumstances that are required for the origination of a leader must partly be created, partly be taken from other sources, and exploited. The most probable means for such a soul to grow up to its greatest height and violence, the most likely tests for it to undergo. In order for such a soul, in order for such a soul to feel the compulsion of these tasks, the new pressure, the new hammer of such a revaluation of values will steal the conscience and transmute the heart into iron so that it might bear the weight of such a responsibility. On the other hand, the necessity of such leaders the terrifying danger that they might be absent or fail and degenerate are those our real cares and darkenings. Do you know this, my free spirits? These are the heavy distant thoughts and thunderings that slip across the skies of our lives. Few pains are as sensitive as the pain of having once seen or sympathized with an extraordinary human being who has derailed and degenerated or even having surmised that such a thing once happened. However, Whoever has an exceptional eye for the total danger that humanity itself will degenerate. Whoever recognizes the monstrous contingency as we do that has been playing games with the future of humanity thus far, a game in which neither hand nor the finger of God has ever played along. Someone who surmised the catastrophic undoing inherit, inherent to the stupid unwittingness and confidingness of modern ideas. Even more, the stupid unwittingness and confidingness that lies concealed, that lie concealed within the whole of Christian European morality. Such a person suffers from an anxiety with which no other anxiety can be compared. He grasps in a single glance what could be bred in humanity with the favorable accumulation and intensification of force and task, he will know with all of the science of his conscience how humanity has still not exhausted its greatest possibilities. He will know how often the human type has already stood before enigmatic decisions and new paths. He or she will know well from his or her most painful memories what a miserable thing it is when a person of the highest rank shatters, when a person of the highest rank shatters, fractures, sinks down, when this happens to someone who is in the process of becoming the total degeneracy of humanity, humanity's degeneration to the status of what the socialistic morons and shallow heads call the human of the future appears as their ideal. This degeneration and minimization of human beings to complete herd animals, or as they say to humans of the free society, this animalization of humanity to dwarfish beasts with their equal rights and claims as possible. There is no doubt about it. There is no doubt of it. Whoever has thought this possibility through to the end will no longer feel nausea. Unlike other people, perhaps he or she will know a new task. That is the end of section five. So a new task. Well, it's clear what Nietzsche is suggesting, isn't it? This is a culture, this is modern culture of minimization. It is not an appropriate breeding ground for exceptional human beings. And as a result, Humanity itself cannot flourish, cannot blossom, cannot grow to its highest height. 
Humanity cannot keep pace with its promise in a culture that is inimical to it, that is adversarial to it, that only gives exceptional human beings adverse conditions, conditions that prevent its development, its evolution. No exceptional human being can grow in the dryness, in the aridity of this kind of a culture. That's what Nietzsche is saying. No new conditions need to be established in order for human beings, in order for exceptional human beings to grow, to develop, to evolve, to reach their greatest height in order for them to actualize their potentialities, their possibilities. I know that, of course, not every possibility can be actualized, but some possibilities can be actualized. Some of them can. And human beings are not living up to their greatest potentialities in a culture such as this because of this culture in which they do not live. No, it's a culture in which they disintegrate, in which they dissolve, in which they decompose, in which they putrefy, in which they rot. That is the culture that Nietzsche is diagnosing here. Is Nietzsche incorrect? Is he wrong? Let's go on to section six. Sixth section, sixth section. We scholars, 204. At the risk that our moralizing will seem to be what it has always been, namely an undiscouraged. Montrer, mm s'il -hmm. plaît. Showing of one's wounds. Merci, Simone. Merci. To quote Balzac, I will dare to countervail against the unseemly and injurious displacement of rank between science and philosophy, which today, with the best conscience, is threatening to be installed. I mean that one must have the right to speak from experience on the loftier question of rank. And experience always signifies, it seems to me, bad experience. <laughs> One must have the right to speak from experience in order not to speak in the way that the blind speak about colors or the way in which artists speak about science. Oh, this terrible science, sigh their instinct and their shame. It always goes down to the root. It's always radical. It always goes down to the radix the ground, the foundation, the scientist's declaration of independence, his or her emancipation from philosophy is one of the more sophisticated after effects of the democratic essence and non-essence. The self-mastery and self-elevation of the scholar is today everywhere in its fullest bloom, in its finest springtime. This does not mean that in this case, his self-praise smells pleasant. Freedom from all masters, this is what the mob instinct wants. And after science turned against theology with the most fortunate success, science was the maid of theology for too long. Now science is legislating philosophy and playing the role of its master with the greatest arrogance and incomprehension. What am I saying? The scientist is playing the role of the philosopher. According to my memory, this is the memory of a scientific man, if I may say so. I have heard young explorers of nature and older doctors talking about philosophy and philosophers, their words teeming with arrogant naivetes, not to mention the most educated and illusioned of all scholars, the philologists and schoolmen who are educated and illusioned by profession. Soon the specialists and the loafers instinctively resisted all the synthetic tasks and capacities. Soon the industrious laborers scented the otium and elegant voluptuousness of the philosopher's household of the soul and felt reduced and belittled. Soon came the color blindness of the pragmatists who saw nothing in philosophy other than a sequence of refuted systems and an extravagant expense that would never do anyone any good. 
Soon sprang up the fear of camouflaged mysticism. Soon sprang up the justification of the limits of cognition. Soon came the disrespect toward individual philosophers, which had been unwittingly generalized to a disrespect toward philosophy itself. Finally, I discovered beneath the arrogant denigration of philosophy, the terrible after effects of what a certain philosopher himself had done. One no longer was submissive to this particular philosopher, but neither did one escape the spell of his dismissive evaluations of other philosophers. The result was a bad feeling about all philosophy. Now here, Nietzsche is alluding to his unofficial teacher, Schopenhauer, yet again. Schopenhauer hated Hegel. And that's not an exaggeration. I mean, Schopenhauer seethed with rage and disgust against Hegel. And he leveled many animadversions against Hegel. Um, but was Schopenhauer wrong? So. Schopenhauer's strongest animadversion was against the Hegelian idea that universal concepts were the only true reality and that nature is rational. You know, the ideal is the real, the real is the ideal. So the normal course of nature, right? The course of nature is somehow intellectual. He thought that, Hegel thought that the natural course of things was universal conceptuality. <clears throat> that didn't he didn't mean that nature could be described by concepts no he just thought that there was spirit there was intellect in nature and in everything nature is rational and what's strange is that and this is schopenhauer's point it's not if you read the um introduction of the published version the first published version of die phenomenologie des geistes the phenomenology of spirit You'll see that in the introduction, um, Hegel believed that the self-acting concepts in the human mind were the truest reality. That's crazy talk. I'm sorry. I mean, that's, it's crude to say that, but Hegel was a blockhead. And I think that Schopenhauer was envious of him and jealous of him. Now, envy and jealousy don't mean the same thing. I might have talked about this before, I don't remember, but I won't talk about it here, but um, Schopenhauer had a very short-lived stint as a professor, and he only had two students. Um, there were two students in his auditorium, and down the corridor was Hegel, and there was a long queue of students, all of them young men, young German men, waiting to get into the auditorium. They couldn't even fit in the auditorium. There were so many young students who wanted to hear Hegel, who was a rock star and a blockhead, that they couldn't fit into this vast auditorium. And, and according to some anecdotes, there were students who were sitting on windowsills in the auditorium just to hear the master speak. Now, I somehow doubt that many of them were listening to Hegel. From what I've read, <laughs> was how Hegel read his lectures. He, he, he spoke in a muffled whisper and no one could understand him. And if you've read Hegel, God help you. I mean, to paraphrase, to paraphrase um, Schopenhauer, if you want to scramble the brains, if you want to ruin and scramble the brains of a young person, you can do no better than give him or her Hegel to read. Now, so what Nietzsche is alluding to are Schopenhauer's animadversions against Hegel in this book. This is the English translation of it. Now, there are many animadversions against Hegel in this book, but I'm just going to read a few of them, only a few of them. So, Schelling was followed by a philosophical ministerial creature, namely Hegel, 
who for political purposes and through a blunder at that, was dubbed a great philosopher from above, a platitudinous, dull, loathsome, repulsive, ignorant charlatan, who with unprecedented impudence scribbled together folly and nonsense that was trumpeted by his venal followers as immortal wisdom and accepted as such by dunces, whereby such a complete chorus of admiration arose as had never before been heard. That's one of the milder critiques of Hegel. And um, this one is a this one is a winner. This one is a darling. Um, yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, there's so much. I mean, I, I don't even know where to begin because this whole page is attacking him. All right, so let, let me just let me just start here. Are not innumerable minds of the current generation of scholars radically eccentric and ruined because of it? Are they not full of corrupt views and give out hollow phrases, vacuous drivel, and repulsive Hegel jargon where we expect thoughts? Is their entire view of life not deranged and has not the most shallow, Philistine, indeed most vulgar attitude taken the place of the noble and lofty thoughts that still inspired their immediate predecessors. In a word, are not the youths matured in the incubator of Hegelry, like men intellectually castrated, unable to think, and full of the most ridiculous presumption? Truly their minds are constituted like the bodies of certain heirs to the throne, who people tried in the past through debaucheries or drugs to render incapable of governing or at least of propagating their line, intellectually enervated, robbed of their proper use of their reason, robbed of the proper use of their reason, a subject of pity and a persistent object of paternal tears. So this is what Nietzsche is alluding to. These are only two examples of the animadversions that Schopenhauer directed against um, Hegel in his, as Nietzsche puts it, in his unintelligent rage. I don't really agree with Nietzsche, though. I, I think that Schopenhauer has a point because I know this is an oft used phrase. And it's some, sometimes connected with Marx, but um, it came from Schopenhauer. Um, Hegel did turn the world on its head. Again, is Schopenhauer wrong? I don't think he is necessarily. To, to return to Nietzsche, such seemed to me, for example, Schopenhauer's after effect on contemporary Germany. With the unintelligent wrath that he spewed at Hegel, Schopenhauer made the last generation of Germans break away from German culture. Everything considered, German culture of the recent past was a zenith and divinatory refinement of the historical sense. However, Schopenhauer himself was impoverished, unreceptive, un-German to the point of ingeniousness in this matter. All things considered, the damage inflicted on the once respectable reputation of philosophy might have to do with the human all to humanness that is the miserable character of contemporary philosophy, which has opened the door to the instinct of the mob. One recognizes the degree to which our modern world has strayed from the Heraclitian type, the Platonic type, and the Empedoclean type, or whatever these regal and magisterial hermits of the spirit might have been called, we should acknowledge the good reasons why such representatives of philosophy, thanks to the fashions of the time, are brought up and brought down, for example, the two lions of Berlin, the anarchist Eugen Döring and the amalgamist Eduard von Hartmann. We should acknowledge the good reasons why a decent person of science would feel oneself to be of a superior type and lineage to those philosophers, especially the mishmash philosophers who call themselves philosophers of reality or positivists, 
those who inspire a dangerous mistrust of philosophy in the soul of a young, ambitious scholar. Such philosophers are, in the best case, themselves scholars and specialists. One can feel it. They are all defeated by science and then resubjected to science. Science somehow wanted more from them without a right to this more and without a responsibility for this more. And now worshipfully, wrathfully, vengefully, philosophy represents a lack of belief in the master task and the masterfulness of philosophy in word and in deed. Finally, how could it be otherwise? Science blossoms today, its good conscience bountifully visible. By contrast, contemporary philosophy is gradually sinking. The remains of philosophy inspire mistrust and a lack of confidence, if not outright mockery and pity. Philosophy has been reduced to epistemology. Essentially, this is nothing more than a meek epochism and a doctrine of temperance, a philosophy that is not permitted to, to traverse the threshold and awkwardly denies entrance. That is philosophy in its dying breath, in its last gasp, its dying breath. A finality, an agony, something that incites pity. How could such a philosophy dominate? I love Nietzsche's characterologies, his typologies. He, he has character studies, and we're going to be reading about them now. There are three. Um, the first is the specialist. The second is the scholar. And the third is the objective person. So, um, yeah, these are psychological case studies. But I do have something to say before we move on. Um, I wouldn't take these characterologies literally. So, so none of these people, these types, are truly neutral. They, they pretend to be neutral, but they are really human all too human, right? So what Nietzsche is doing is he's counterpoising and counterposing the masks that they wear with their own fragile, brittle, human, all too human selves. So you've got to keep that in mind. It's, it's, sometimes Nietzsche will describe the mask and sometimes he will describe the self behind the mask. And it's very important to keep these separate. And again, don't literalize the text, okay? All right, so we're gonna go on to 205. This is the specialist. So, there are in truth so many dangers today to the development of the philosopher that one has reason to doubt whether such a fruit can ever ripen. The tower of the sciences has grown to monstrous proportions and with it the likelihood, the likelihood that the philosopher will tire of learning or will stop learning altogether and instead specialize. The result will be that he will never reach his height or she will never reach her height and never be able to survey, to look around, to look down, or he or she will reach his or her height too late when his or her best time will long have been over and his or her energy will long have been expended or he or she will become so damaged, vulgarized, degenerated that his or her vision the totality of his or her value judgments will mean very little anymore. Even the refinement of his or her intellectual conscience hesitates and causes him or her to hesitate. He or she becomes afraid of the seductions of dilettantism, of the millipede with its thousand feelers. He or she knows all too well that anyone who loses one's self-respect no longer commands as a knower, no longer leads, he or she would be forced to become a great actor, a philosophical caliostro and rat catcher of spirits. In short, he or she would become a seducer. Ultimately, it comes down to a question of taste, if not a question of conscience. 
and to redouble the difficulties of the philosopher, he or she is required to give a judgment, not on the sciences, but on life and on the value of life. He or she is required to give a judgment, a yes or a no. He or she is reluctant to believe that he or she has the right, much less the obligation, to have such a judgment. He or she believes that he or she would have to search through the most comprehensive range of experiences, perhaps even through the most disturbing and destructive experiences before coming to this right, to this belief. And he or she believes that he or she would have to do so hesitantly, doubtingly, mutedly, mutely, mutely. In fact, the crowd has misinterpreted the philosopher for a long time. They have confused him or her with the religiously exalted desensibilized, desecularized fanatics and God-intoxicated drunkards. And even today, one hears someone being praised for living wisely or for living as a philosopher lives. This means nothing more than smart and distant. Wisdom. To the mob, that seems a form of illusion. E-L-U-S-I-O-N. A trick, a means of getting oneself out of a nasty game. However, the real philosopher lives unphilosophically and unwise. Doesn't it, seem to, doesn't it seem so to us, my friends? Above all, the real philosopher lives uncleverly and feels the weight and the duty of 100 experiments and temptations of life. He constantly risks himself. He plays the nasty game. So the next characterology, the next type is the scholar. I'm going to, Nietzsche uses the masculine pronoun and I'm going to be using it because it seems as if Nietzsche, first of all, Nietzsche uses a masculine pronoun. And secondly, it seems to me that Nietzsche is talking about a specific person who he then generalizes. So it seems fair. Um, and there's nothing flattering that's said about this man if, if anything, this is a form of feminism. As we'll see, it's a, it's a kind of crypto-feminism. So it's, it's really a critique of a kind of man. So why not, why not keep the masculine pronoun? <clears throat> Excuse me. 206. In relation to the genius, that is, in relation to a creature who creates or births, both words should be taken in their widest application. The scholar is a scientific commoner. The scholar is, is, Nietzsche is suggesting, is sterile, is infertile, is not creative at all. The scholar has a dependent mind, right? The scholar is dependent on the work of creators, of artists, of poets, of writers, of philosophers, I mean of thinkers. The scholar is anti-creative. That's what Nietzsche is suggesting here. Anyway, he has something of the old maid about him. After all, he doesn't know how to participate in the two most valuable human activities. He seems to uh, be referring to um, procreation, right? Making babies, contributing to birth in the literal sense, but also aesthetic productivity, aesthetic creativity, right? The scholar doesn't participate in making other human beings, and he doesn't participate in the art of making images, even if these images are verbal images, right? The scholar doesn't do anything. The scholar just replicates. The scholar is a smoothly polished surface. And what he does is he tries to smooth out um, all of his distinctive human traits. But again, that's the mask. That is the mask. Remember that, please. People admit that both the scholar and the old maid are respectable. Mm -hmm. Respectable people. And one emphasizes this admission, but this is, as it were, a kind of compensation. Why? Because everyone knows that the scholar isn't much. One is annoyed by the fact that one is compelled to make this concession. 
Let us look at this matter a bit more precisely. What is a scientific person? Above all, he is an undistinguished type of human. Someone with the virtues of an undistinguished type of human. That is someone who is not dominating, not authoritarian, and also not self-sufficient. Right, again, he is not an independent thinker. He's not a creative thinker. He has a, de he has a dependent mind. He's not able to think critically about anything. He's anti-creative. He is industrious. He patiently arranges things in sequences and in rows. In whatever he can do and must do, he is regular and measured. He has an instinctive understanding of those who are like he is and for what they require. He requires, for instance, a portion of independence, a green meadow, the peacefulness without which no work can be done. He claims honor and recognition, which presuppose acknowledgement, acknowledgeableness, the sunshine of a good name, the constant seal of his worth and usefulness. This allows him to overcome again and again that inner mistrust, which lies at the core of all dependent people and herd animals. The scholar usually has the diseases and disorders of the undistinguished type. Don't take that literally. It doesn't mean that literally. He is fraught with petty envies and has a lynx's eye for the coarsest qualities of those whose heights he will never scale. Yeah, he's, he's nothing more than the appendage of the state. He's an organ of the state. He is servile, slavish to the state, to the institution whose ends he serves. He is confiding, but in the fashion of someone who lets himself go without ever releasing himself. Remember what Nietzsche told us earlier, openness is a form of concealment. I mean, that was my that was my interpretation of the aphorism, but, you know, talking about oneself, as Nietzsche writes, can be a way of concealing oneself. So the scholar talks and talks and talks, but he doesn't ever really disclose himself. And when people are around him who are sharing intimacies, intimacies, intimate secrets, when they're being familiar, when they're being open, oh, he takes mental notes. He transcribes what they say so that he can use their words against them because he's petty. He's petty and he's pettish. He's fault finding. He's trivial. He's a trivial person who has a mind obsessed with trivialities and has no ideas of his own, no thoughts of his own. He presents himself as a reflective surface upon which genius shines. But that's not his genius. It's the genius of the people whose books he's dissecting. And I deliberately use that word dissect or vivisect because he kills. He kills creativity and he has a cadaver in front of him and he mutilates the cadaver. And then he itemizes and catalogs the cadaver, right? That's his job, that's his task. To return to the text, and when he is around people who are releasing themselves, he just stands there colder and more closed off than anyone in the room. His eye becomes like a slick, self-withholding lake without a ripple of delight, without a ripple of sympathy, the nastiest and most dangerous things of which a scholar is capable come from the instinct for mediocrity, which instinctively works on annihilating the uncommon human being and which strives to break the tense bow, or even better, strives to bend the tense bow. The bending happens with, with considerateness, with a gentle hand, of course, bending with confiding pity. That is a real art of Jesuitism, which has always understood how to introduce itself 
as the religion of pity. Now we turn to the objective person who is a much more disastrous and pitiful character and figure. Um, let us remember Nietzsche's diagnosis of modernity. Let us remember Nietzsche's diagnosis of modernity. Modern human beings are not inventive enough. And the scholar is intellectually and creatively stultified. Remember, according to Nietzsche in the modern age, no one is allowed to exceed the level of the crowd, right? No one is allowed to differentiate oneself from anyone else intellectually. That's not allowed. And to champion one's own excellence is seen as being undemocratic, sure, but also more pointedly affrontive to the crowd. But now we're going to encounter someone who again is much more pitiful and disastrous than the scholar. Now this, this objective person, uh, remember objective just means object oriented. It doesn't mean neutral. This is someone who tries to be neutral. He tries to dehumanize himself, depersonalize himself. And, and, and Nietzsche describes him almost as if he were a subaquatic creature, like a sponge. And that's a good, it's a good metaphor. He's like a, a subaquatic sponge that has tendrils and tentacles. You'll see what I mean. Um, and uh, the objective person is a paragon of virtue. Well, which virtues? Well, his virtuousness is subservience to the institution. Um, but his subservience, his servility, his slavishness is hostile to his health. And he does violence to his own health and to his sanity. Um, his virtuousness is toxic to his own human requirements, his own human needs. He's doing violence to himself in the name of the virtues of subservience and diligence by pretending to polish himself, as you'll see. He's a reflective surface, or he, well, he thinks of himself, he presents himself as a reflective surface. He, he pretends to smooth himself off and efface himself of any human qualities. But again, he is fragile. He is human all too human. He's brittle. He's delicate. Um, but like <clears throat> the, the scholar, as we've seen, is subservient to the thoughts of truly creative people. Um, but the objective person, again, is much worse off than that. You'll see what I mean. 207. Who has not been bored to death with all of this subjectiveness and damned ipsiety-mosity? However grateful one might be to the objective spirit, and however one might welcome it with gratitude, in the end, however, one must learn to be cautious with one's gratitude and put an end to the exaggerated celebration of the deselving and depersonalization that the spirit has recently been subjected to, as if it were the redemption and the transfiguration, as if that were the end in itself. Now, what does he mean? So Nietzsche is essentially saying at the beginning of this passage, um, look, look, I'm not a big fan of subjectivity. I'm not a fan of romanticism and the piety of romanticism, all of this grubbing around in the soul all of these confessions of the self and all of this sentimentality, this kind of effusion of emotion. I'm sick of it too. But why completely annihilate subjectivity, which is something that he's going to talk about? Why, why does it have to be one extreme or the other? So, so he, he understands he's sick to death and bored to death of subjectivism. But there has to be 
some personality somewhere. I mean, you, you don't want to erase your whole personality and become, you know, robotic. I know that's, that's post Nietzsche, but still. This de-selving and depersonalization of the spirit has been tending to happen in the pessimist school, which has its own reasons for honoring disinterested knowledge. The objective person, here we go, the objective person who, unlike the pessimist, no longer swears and reprobates, is the ideal learner. After 1,000 failures and semi-failures, he is the one in whom the scientific instinct blooms. Assuredly, he is one of the most expensive tools that exist. He belongs in the hand of the one who has more power than he. Again, the objective person is an instrument of an institution. Of the, he, is, he is an instrument of the state. He is only an instrument, as it were. He is a mirror. He has no self-purpose. The objective person is, in fact, a mirror who is used to supplicating itself before anything that wants to be known, with no desires other than those required by knowledge or by reflection. He waits until something comes along and then by and then extends himself so tenderly that even the delicate footfalls and sliding by of spiritual beings will not elude his surface and skin. That's 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 what I was talking about earlier, like this subaquatic sponge with tendrils and tentacles. That's how he seems to me. Um, what little personality he still possesses seems to him supervenient, arbitrary, or even more often troubling. Yeah, I mean, it's as if the objective person is looking at himself in a mirror. He is a mirror looking at himself in a mirror and saying, wait, I, I feel an emotion. I feel something that's almost like a human emotion. That's very unscientific. I'm not a useful tool if I feel emotion. I can't process this. This is the extent to which he has come to see himself as the conduit and reflection of external shapes and events. He can only conjure the memory of his self with great effort, and it is not uncommon for his memories to be inexact. He easily mistakes himself for other people. He misunderstands his personal needs, and this is the only place in which he is unsophisticated and inadvertent. Now, I pride myself on being a very um, faithful translator, but this passage, I was very creative with this passage. I had to be. So what I do is I let the language breathe. I make it more literary um, because the German was not, I, it, it, it couldn't be transliterated because that wouldn't have been a workable translation. So I am faithful. I am faithful to the text, but I also let the language breathe a bit. I had to. Okay, keep that in mind, please. It might happen that he is worried about the well-being of wife or friend. It might happen that he is bothered by the small-mindedness of wife or friend. It might happen that he is annoyed by the claustrophobia-inducing atmosphere that emanates from wife or friend. It might happen that he is concerned about his lack of friends or other social connections. Indeed, he forces himself to meditate on his torment, but in vain. His thoughts quickly roam to the more general case, and tomorrow he knows as little as he knew yesterday how to help himself. He no longer takes himself seriously and no longer has time for himself. He is sanguine not because he is free from trouble, but because he lacks the ability to grasp and handle his trouble. The inveterate obeisance toward every object and experience, the sunny and placid hospitality with which he accepts everything that strikes him, his brand of inconsiderate benevolence, of dangerous, of dangerous unconcernedness as to yes or no. Alas, 
there are enough instances in which he must atone for his virtues. And as a human being generally considered, he becomes far too easily the caput mortuum of these virtues. Should one want love or hatred from him? I mean, love and hatred in quotation marks, as God, woman, and animal understand them. He will do what he can, he will do what he can and give what he can, but no one should be surprised if it does not amount to much. If he should show himself precisely on this point to be artificial, brittle, questionable, and decomposable. His love is forced, his hatred is synthetic, or rather, untoured force. A slight display of vaingloriousness or affectation. He is only authentic to the extent that he can be objective. Only in his sanguine totalization is he still a form of nature, is he still natural. His mirroring and eternally auto-polishing soul no longer knows how to affirm, no longer knows how to negate. He does not command, nor does he destroy. With Leibniz, he utters, Je ne méprise presque rien. Merci, Simone. Merci bien. I have contempt for almost nothing. Don't ignore or diminish the value of the presque, the almost. Nor is he the model human. He does not go in front of anyone, nor does he ever go behind. Generally, he puts himself in such a remote position that he has never had any reason to truck with good or evil. If he has long been mistaken for a philosopher, if he has long been confused with a Caesarian breeder and autocrat for civilization, he has been granted far too much honor and the essential point about him as has been overlooked. He is but an instrument, a slavish thing, though by all means the sublimest kind of slave. He is, however, nothing in himself, presque rien. The objective human is an instrument, a precious, easily damaged, easily tarnished, measuring instrument and specular art piece that should be taken care of and honored. But he is no goal, neither escape nor shaft, nor no complementary man, complementary with an E in the middle, in whom the rest of existence would justify itself, no terminus, and still less a point of departure, a generating or a first cause, nothing sturdy or prepotent, nothing set up by itself, nothing that wants to be master. Rather, he is merely a tender, bloated, delicate, mobile. Let me say that again. Rather, he is merely a tender, bloated, delicately mobile piece of pottery that is waiting for some kind of form and content. He is waiting for someone to shape him. All things considered, he is a, he is a human without content or form. A selfless human, selfless is in quotation marks. Consequentially, he is of no use to women. In parentheses, in parentheses. Again, I, I want to emphasize that Nietzsche is not always a misogynist. He's sometimes a misogynist, but sometimes he's a feminist. He's a crypto-feminist, a Nietzschean feminist, and even a phylogenist, a lover of women. Um, th there are many passages in which women are praised to the sky by Nietzsche. Nietzsche praises women to the sky. In the gay science, for example, he says that woman is life itself. Now, one might object to woman, you know, as like an essentiality, and I get that. But, um, you know, Nietzsche, there, there, there was a friend of Nietzsche by the name of Marie Baumgartner who translated some of Nietzsche's works into French. She was the mother 
of one of Nietzsche's students. And um, she made a suggestion. She suggested a change in human all to human, and Nietzsche made it. Now, if he were really a hater of women, he wouldn't have allowed a female reader and translator to alter one of his books. I, I don't, I, I think that Nietzsche's stance toward women is very complex. And um, if you'd like to read more about this, read my essay on Human All Too Human, which is available for free online. And uh, read Derrida, although I'm not a fan, I'm not a fanatic. Um, you could read Derrida's book, Spurs. I think here is a good place to end. This was a long video. Thank you very much. Until next time. Goodbye.